Welcome to New Wave Global. You are watching Unraveled with Marvi Sarmat. His BJP emerged as the single largest party in recent Lok Sabha elections in which the people of Jammu and Kashmir participated in unprecedented numbers. The voter turnout was a historic high and generated hopes for a new era of internal peace and harmony. Were these attacks related to it in any way? Will these terrorist attacks impact the transition to peace and responsive democracy in the state? Or the fateful region will once again succumb to the gore of war and strife? How will these unfortunate and absolutely condemnable cowardly attacks both for the Pakistan-India relations in this fresh term of Prime Minister Modi? To unpack all of this, we have with us tonight Praveen Swami, a distinguished journalist and expert on South Asian security and intelligence. With decades of experience, Praveen has reported extensively on terrorism, intelligence, and military affairs in the region. Thank you for joining in, Praveen. Can you provide us with an overview of the recent attacks? Uh, what, what do we know about the perpetrators and their motives? Well, first of all, Marvi, thank you for having me on this program. And thank you for flagging my years of experience, which knowing you is a polite way of saying how old I am without telling the audience. Uh, <laughs> But to, but to go on, uh, I, I think a little bit of the backstory is very important here. Uh, as people in our audience will know, in 2019, India and Pakistan had come very close to the edge of war after the bombing, terrorist bombing in Pulwama. Uh, and a great deal of uh, back-channel diplomacy went on involving uh, countries that were friendly with both India and Pakistan uh, to try and pull them back from the edge. And one of the things uh, that was there uh, going on during that period was a secret channel, which is believed to have involved uh, General Kamar Javed Bajwa and the Indian National Security Advisor uh, Ajit Dover uh, through RAW and the ISI. Hmm. So uh, this back channel uh, was to lead to the ceasefire that went into force on the line of control in 2021. Earlier ceasefire was there before that, but it had kind of fallen apart uh, after the Indian strikes across the line of control uh, after the Uri terrorist attack in 2016, then mm. uh, it was it was revived and put in place. Mm. Um, now, uh, part of that deal, remember that uh, uh, various pressures were there on Pakistan, mounted by its grey listing under by the Financial Action Task Force also. But part of the deal was a sort of winding down uh, these jihadi activities. And after Pulwama, we know that General uh, Bajwa quite substantially did a lot of these things. Uh, mm. So many uh, Jaish camps are reported to, jaish e Mohammed camps are reported to have been shut down. Uh, mm. You know, the, the seminary, the main seminary in Bahawalpur was put under administration. Uh, there was action against the lashkar e taiba also. Hafiz Muhammad Zahid and others uh, went to jail on terror financing charges. Uh, but what seems to have happened. And remember, this is all behind the scenes. So I'm speculating here on the basis of what people have told me. But what seems to have happened is that General Bajwa wanted some political concessions. And what he essentially told the Indians is, look, I've delivered quite a lot on my end of the deal. Now you hmm. need to give me something so I can justify or legitimize what I'm doing. Uh, within my own military, within my own uh, sort of power circles and establishment and to the public. And uh, one of the ideas that was floated uh, from, from his side was, uh, you know, maybe restoring some of the constitutional project, uh, protections the Jammu and Kashmir people uh, enjoyed against purchase of land by outsiders and so on. So various ideas were discussed. Uh, but by this time, the Indians were not very receptive. And the Indian argument was, look, every time we've gone forward on a dialogue like this, uh, whether it's uh, with uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif or before that with General Parvez Musharraf, uh, you've taken some steps to dismantle terrorism, but you haven't gone far enough. And eventually something has blown up, uh, which has ended up discrediting the Indian political leadership in its eyes. So you need to go further. So anyway, this background dialogue was going on. Uh, 
and this was going on after the uh, you know the statehood was taken and uh, it, that was 2019 you know right after uh, pulwama that sequence of events happened and this dialogue going on in the background now remember general bajwa had reason to believe that look i've gone out of my way to help the indians mm -hmm. uh, say for example when the crisis was going on uh, between india and china on the line of actual control uh, had he moved more troops to the line of control the india uh, pakistan border uh, mm -hmm. it would have made it very hard for india to pull out acclimatized troops from high altitudes of the line of control and redeploy them in ladakh but he didn't do that so you know he had a reason to think he was being helpful uh, i think the indians were also justified in what they were saying but things were at a bit of a deadlock they were not moving forward they were jammed and that's when you see in late 2021 uh, the string of small terrorist actions begin in jammu and kashmir again uh, starting with the killing of five indian soldiers in a place called chamrer in punch mm -hmm. Uh, and then every few you know weeks months there are some sort of pin poking actions um if you like just you know sticking the finger in not big mm -hmm. like pulwama uh but attacks carried out by highly trained uh, jihadis uh, uh all targeting the indian military or police forces and in most of those instances the, the ambushes are so professionally done militarily that the indians uh, don't manage to get any of the attackers so clearly somebody quite skilled and efficient operating you have some infiltration attempts again quite visibly happening but not high enough to escalate matters that go out of hand and that leads up finally to this attack in riasi where a uh, terrorist fire on a bus carrying pilgrims uh, to a shrine Uh, what we can make out by speaking uh, to people who were in the bus though you know we have to be careful uh, till all the forensics and so on are available is that the bullets hit the front windscreen of the bus probably killing the driver or injuring the driver quite badly and the conductor but he swerved and the bus went off the road and some of the yeah. other people were were killed um so you know uh, in in a way though it sounds like a horrible thing to say 10 dead is a lot of innocent people uh, who were killed but it could have been far worse mm -hmm. uh, and my guess is that in this age of uh, you know modern communication whoever carried it out would have carried it out knowing full well that uh, prime minister modi was being sworn in around that time in delhi and my speculation is this is a message from the other side saying that look your third terms beginning uh, if we want to we can ratchet up the pain so sit down and think about what it is you want to do um now how the indians will react to this uh, obviously you know uh, an incident of this scale no one is going to go to war over um but india has been waging its own uh, seems to have been waging its own covert campaign against jihadis there have been a number of mysterious unexplained assassinations uh, in pakistan uh, maybe the indians will try and step that up uh, mm -hmm. maybe there will be some response in kashmir maybe who knows the indians will explore what their options are because there are elections coming up in kashmir Uh, scheduled to happen tentatively though again it's speculative yeah. by september or october um so maybe mm -hmm. the indians will want some sort of peace and quiet in the kashmir valley uh, by that That's point right. we, we we don't it's it's very hard to say so all these options here but once again unfortunately this uh, cycle happening in jammu and kashmir where india and pakistan kind of set about talking but find themselves at a deadlock then there is a big terrorist incident and we lurch towards a crisis once again this happened in 1999 you had the kargil war after okay. prime minister nawaz sharif and prime minister vajpayee uh, made some efforts uh, you had the 2001 2002 terrible military crisis which ground down for months uh, 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 there again you know sabotaging all the gains that had uh, sort started coming about after the end of kargil you had uh, uh, mumbai follow the secret diplomacy that took place between general musharraf and uh, prime minister manmohan singh uh, and then you had the pathan court and uri attacks after mm. uh, president modi himself remember early in his term was quite optimistic about striking some kind of deal 
uh, both hmm. he and Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif went the extra mile down that road, but hmm. completely sabotaged by Pathan Court and uh, Uri. So you have this sad record, and we can only hope that we don't end up, you know, again right. yeah. in some kind of terrible crisis. These attacks have started, I mean, some, you know, from 2021 to now. Um, the Hindu actually writes today, only today they have written, that um, around 26 attacks have happened in Rajori Poonch uh, uh, sector, uh, the Jammu division. So do, do you think that this uh, terror theater is moving from valley to the mountain uh, mountains of Jammu division? Uh, is it moving there? And, and what is the significance of it is? So uh, it's it's easier to understand if you understand the significance. Uh, the Jammu division on uh, both sides of what is today the line of control was the site of horrible violence at the time of partition. So we often think of Jammu Kashmir as something that you know escaped the uh, horrors of the plains and Punjab at that point. But that's not really true. Uh, there were terrible atrocities in Poonch and in Jammu city itself during that period. Large-scale killings. Uh, of both Hindus and Muslims, depending where in that region they were. Um, hmm. And uh, it, you, you may recall that uh, in 1947-47, uh, even before uh, the you know, Kabaili raids on uh, the Indian side of Kashmir took place, um, hmm. uh, there was a rebellion in Mirpur against the Maharaja's authority. And that's where things, you know, if you like, the clock or the machine started ticking that let us... Uh, into this Kashmir conflict that drags on so many decades uh, later. Now, the Jammu division mm. is also mm. interesting because uh, the areas of Rajori and Poonch are ethnically, mm. linguistically also close to uh, places like Mirpur uh, on the other side of the border. Uh, okay. Dogri is much closer to uh, Punjabi, if you like, Potohari, mm -hmm. if you uh, wish to use the dialect name. Yeah. Pahari uh, language. Kashmir. Pahari yeah. languages, they're much yeah. closer than uh, uh, Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And also Rajori and Pooch are important transit routes to get to the Kashmir Valley. So if it's literally, okay. if you start, if you cross the line of control and start walking across the mountains, uh, mm -hmm. you will be in Kashmir in a couple of days time. It's, you know, uh, there are a lot of mountain routes and gullies which cut across that region. So always in the beginning, there was some level of infiltration from some of these areas. Rajori mm -hmm. to Kashmir and back again. Uri and Titwal uh, in Kashmir are also kind of crossing routes. But this mm -hmm. option was there and in some ways is a lot easier because it's a very remote, underdeveloped area with a lot of forested areas where an infiltrator has quite easy access. The valley itself is a little bit like a, the bottom of a katori, if you like, with these high mountains all around it. But the valley is well connected by road. Uh, mm. It's a flat bowl and it's much easier for Indian forces to operate there than in uh, Rajori Poonch and Doda and, and so on and so forth. Uh, plus, there is this element of communal volatility. So, again, mm. to, I'm, I'm being a little crude here, uh, but the areas south of the Chenab River, which cuts through Jan Jammu Division, mm. are broadly speaking a Hindu majority. And areas okay. north of the Chenab River are broadly speaking a uh, Muslim majority Then going okay. into Kashmir. And hmm. one of the ideas that's been there from 1947-1948 uh, and periodically you know, been picked up by various people is, okay, worst comes to worst, we should partition Kashmir using the same logic that was used during the partition of India and divide it between the areas north of the Chenab and south of the Chenab. This was called... Uh, the Chenab plan or the Sir Owen Dixon plan mm. uh, in the 50s. And it's, mm. it's so that's another sort of layer which, you know, plays. Mm. Anyway, in the mid 90s, the Jammu region, uh, you know, when all this peace talk stuff began, uh, mm. various jihadi groups started taking Jammu very, very, you know, uh, importantly, I think as a result of some of these political considerations. And there were large number of massacres of Hindu villagers in these areas. Uh, and by 96, these massacres had reached a point where uh, hundreds of people were getting killed in these in, in Jammu. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, in 1998, there was a large massacre at a small uh, village called Prankot, quite close to where this bus massacre uh, has mm -hmm. happened, where the bus killings have happened. 
uh, I, if I memory serves me correctly, uh, uh, some you know, uh, uh, seventeen villagers were killed in this tiny hamlet, and mm. the idea was to drive Hindus into Hindu majority areas and uh, make sure that north of the Chenab there would be no uh, Hindu presence. Mm. Now this embarrassed the BJP government a great deal, uh, the NDA government which was in power then. And in 1998, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government, which was trying on the one hand to do these peace talks, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee and Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif were you know, engaged in this whole uh, diplomatic uh, process. Uh, hmm. These killings took away a lot of the political momentum and capital from this uh, engagement and dialogue process. Um, and the government in 98 was obliged to uh, put something called the Disturbed Areas Act in Jammu uh, also and pump in a lot of additional troops, which made it look weak and ineffective. Saying, you know, you guys talk about hardline nationalism, patriotism, but look, you're getting a hammering. And made it very difficult for the BJP to move forward with the peace process at that point. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, whoever has done this will also have a good idea that, look, in Jammu, it's easy to operate and create a lot of pressures on uh, uh, the Indian government because it's a Hindu area. It's very mm. difficult for the military to operate effectively in that area. So maybe there is some thought about instead of focusing on the Kashmir Valley, making Rajori and Punch uh, hot again. Uh, before these mm. coming elections, because it's relatively easy to do. Okay. Uh, from the sound of it, I I sense that uh, you are quite convinced. And in fact, the officials in Jammu, uh, I heard some of the police uh, officials in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, especially R.R. Swain um, and others, also a BJP leader from Jammu, uh, they he, they are all accusing ISI of Pakistan for uh, orchestrating these attacks. And uh, I, I sense a sort of a consensus in the Indian media that these attacks were orchestrated from the Pakistani side and worse from, by the ISI. Um, do, do you have any, I mean, uh, why is that? Why would ISI do this at this point um what would be the motive you know apart from sending this message where uh you know for you know do something and or, or or we can do more um at this time when pakistan's military is itself in a a lot of uh, mess um on the domestic front and right. also economically so why why do you think uh one uh, Indian side is so convinced it is um, official, uh, you know, orchestration from Pakistan. And two, why would Pakistan do it? Okay. So I should say up front that, uh, you know, if there is any intelligence on who carried out this particular attack, I'm not privy to it. I don't know. Uh, I have no evidence, but I think there are some facts that are relevant or important. Mm -hmm. They're not proof, but there are some relevant uh, things. The first of those is that in uh, a number of, uh, we have a lot of testimony from villagers, both Hindu and Muslim in Rajori and Pooch, saying that mm. numbers of jihadists have again been coming from Pakistan after the uh, late uh, autumn of 2021, that the number has come up. And in a lot of areas, people have talked about the comings and goings of these infiltrating groups. Mm. Now, remember any uh, jihadis who go through this area, any terrorists who go through this area, uh, have to maintain some contact with the villagers. They have to stop for food or for shelter. Uh, there are a lot of Gujar communities in that area who go into the high pastures. They have a very good idea who is going through. So one does as a journalist, you talk to people, you hear about these uh, movements. And certainly in the uh, area of Shivkori, uh, in the mountains above Shivkori, villagers have been talking about this for quite some time. And there's been an apprehension that something... Uh, might mm. happen. Mm. Uh, the second relevant factor is uh, on social media and other feeds, we've seen that the jaish e mohammed in particular, but also the lashkar e taiba uh, have become quite public about proclaiming that uh, their uh, cadre are in fact serving over here. 
uh, there was just a few weeks ago a very public function in Pakistan administered Kashmir uh, on the other side of the line of control uh, where uh, uh, there were there were namaz e ghaibana held for uh, one uh, lashkar e taiba operative who was killed uh, in uh, Kashmir um, and you've had a number of these functions on one occasion in 2022 uh, you even had people firing shots in the air to you know uh, pay homage uh, to people and my impression or my understanding is this kind of visible activity this kind of visible mobilization in uh, the pakistan side of uh, the line of control would not happen without a at least benevolent uh, attitude of the isi uh, we know from our journalistic colleagues there and so on that a lot of hmm. a tight a tight watch is kept on activity uh, and you know we know that the isi can stop these things from happening when it chooses so the fact that they are happening is a important data point for me that somebody wants to send a message and uh, mm -hmm. the third sort of important element i think that's worth thinking about uh, in in all this is uh, that general bajwa on on general uh, on on, sorry, on general asim muni's watch uh, mm -hmm. Unlike General Bajwa or you know some of his predecessors, General Munir does not seem ideologically committed uh, to taking forward the Indian uh, India-Pakistan peace process. Uh, General Bajwa made an effort. Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif made an effort. Uh, but uh, Prime Minister uh, Shahbaz Sharif and General Bajwa and General Munir don't seem quite that interested for whatever uh, you know good or bad reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think there is a frustration within the Pakistani military establishment saying, look, the Indians are not being reasonable. So maybe we should nudge them to being a little reasonable by using uh, some amount of coercive force. Now, this is not the first time something like this has happened. Uh, and I, you know, I'm personally not very sanguine about these uh, nudges. Uh, the problem with nudging somebody is that you never know how hard the blow is going to fall. So right. I, I don't know if the people who attacked parliament expected that it would be such a big thing or Pulwama that it would be such a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot calibrate these things. Once you know you put a gun in somebody's hand, ultimately they decide what they're going to do with it. So yeah. I'm, I'm quite nervous. We've seen things derailed a number of times. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but I, I, I think on the Pakistani side, uh, there is frustration with some of the hawkish comments Indian politicians have made. Prime Minister Modi in his election campaign saying, Chudia uh, Phenandenge, Ghar mein Ghuske Mara hai, a number of other people. And if I was a Pakistani general, I would be thinking, yeah, if this guy is saying these things, uh, maybe I should show him that, uh, you know, don't, 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 don't go down that road. I can also do some things. Uh, but I mean, that's speculation on my part. But uh, Putting myself in, in the other guy's shoes, I would be thinking that, you know, oh, this kind of language is being used. It undermines me. Maybe I should send a little message back. Yeah, but on the, you know, on the flip side, let me be devil's advocate. Uh, uh, the, the, the argument can be that like in 2019, um, Pathan Court, it was Pathan Court attack, right? Uh, just before the, uh, before the Pulwama, election. Pulwama, Pulwama. Pulwama. Pulwama, yeah. So Pulwama attack was converted into big election issue that probably won Mr. Modi the second term. Uh, the current election uh, did not bring back Mr. Modi uh, with that kind of uh, you know bang uh, like 2019, and he uh, his BJP could not even get the uh, the the majority on its own. Uh, so they are visibly in a weaker position. Uh, then they were in 2019 or in 2014. Uh, so this th these attacks are actually strengthening um, uh, Mr. Modi's narrative, and would would he would have more space to lionize his, um, uh, you know, his uh, his otherwise communal and anti-Pakistan speech. So one and two is um, I have heard Indian some of the former Indian intelligence officials, former. Uh, on Indian media, uh, who are convinced that, seem to be convinced that the Gujar community, as you said, uh, who used to be quite pro-India um, and a good source of intelligence for uh, for Indian uh, security, um, uh, you know, uh, paraphernalia, are no more 
uh, that could be a source of intelligence. So intelligence is not good intelligence, good human intelligence is not being shared from the Gujar community. And that might be a big, uh, you know, uh, reason why these attacks could not be, uh, could not be, you know, anticipated and were not Indian in, intelligence was not well prepared for that. So is it possible that this is an internal, um, you know, dynamic because the state who is, you know, Kashmir is waiting for the statehood, which is promised, which is committed, uh, it is not returning. So is it possible that the, all of this internal politics might have been responsible for these homegrown attacks and ISI or Pakistan is not even involved? Is it a possibility? So let me let me answer the second part of that uh, first about the Gujars. Yes, I mean, the Gujars have become very bitter with uh, the Indian system uh, mm. because of bad politics, basically. Now, mm. the BJP, in order to carve out its own constituency, uh, gave uh, reservations in jobs uh, to something called the Pahadi community. And the Pahadis are both Hindus and Muslims, but Hindus yes, and sir. Muslims of the upper caste, like the Rajputs. And historically, mm. in this region, the Gujars were the most backward community. Um, the BJP government uh, decided that, you know, they'll give some reservation to the Pahadis, but the Gujars feel very hurt about this, uh, saying that, you know, this was a historically elite community, the Pahadis, either Muslim or Hindu. Uh, why should the upper castes and people who historically have been oppressors of the Gujar get this representation? Now, it's a complicated debate. I don't want to give us, you know, simplistic version. Uh, mm -hmm. But definitely the Gujars have felt let down. And if you travel in these areas very frequently, Marvi, you will hear that uh, people will say, oh, we fought on the Indian side. Uh, we gave blood. We fought uh, the jihadis. What have we got for it? You know, we've, mm -hmm. we've, we've ended up getting, getting this. Mm -hmm. So definitely resentment. But I don't want to overstate the importance of this. Like I said, the worst phase of violence in uh, the Jammu region was in the mid and late 1990s. You know, and literally what we're seeing today is a drop mm. in the ocean compared to the level of killings uh, at that point in Jammu Division. Mm. Uh, you, you know, large massacres, killings, very, very troubled uh, situation. Uh, and at that point, though the Gujars were, if you like, on the Indian team, it didn't decisively settle it. In fact, the level of violence did not fall until 2001. Uh, mm -hmm. When General Parvez Musharraf first put, uh, 2003, excuse me, when General Parvez Musharraf first agreed on a ceasefire on the line of control, which made it much easier for the Indians uh, to police the uh, line of control because mm -hmm. there was no more shelling and firing going on and troops could actually move about to protect uh, the, the, the border. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, even then, despite additional troops being pumped in, uh, despite, uh, uh, you know, the support of the Gujars, despite in some areas, Gujars themselves fighting uh, mm. uh, jihadi groups, uh, things were much, much worse. And in a region like this, which is, you know, wild, high altitude, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think fighting an insurgency is extremely difficult at the best of times, if one side decides to step it up. Um, now, on to the first part of the question about Pathan Court, there are all kinds of uh, hypotheses. Uh, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I like to go by the evidence. And uh, the reason I believe the Jaish e Mohammed did it is because the Jaish e Mohammed admitted they had done it uh, quite publicly on their social media and telegram feeds and all until backing off, you know, some length of time afterwards. Uh, many speeches, pamphlets, posters have emerged in uh, the years and months after. There's a whole body of, of evidence. You have the confession of the bomber himself uh, on videotape before he made out, uh, went, mm -hmm. went to carry out the, the bombing. So I, I'm not persuaded by the conspiracy theory. Yes, I think Prime Minister Modi profited from it. But if you look at the opinion polling and other indicators uh, in the weeks uh, before the election, uh, most of them were predicting a victory for him anyway. Now, would it have been as big a victory as he got or not? I mean, that we can debate. We have, mm. you know, no side has any way of proving it. Yeah. Uh, my personal guess is probably not. It may not have been as big. It may have been more resembling uh, this time. Uh, mm. But even this time, he's walked away with what by historical Indian standards is a pretty decent uh, party performance uh, where he's got a government that is 
not a majority but not insecure either um so i i don't think there's any doubt it have formed a government at that point anyway now my guess about pakistani thinking and this is again you know involves having put putting yourself in someone else's shoes if i can't afford to risk another uh, showdown with india if mm-hmm. my economic position is bad Mm-hmm. do i want to let the indians take advantage of that and keep squeezing me and doing whatever they like and thinking they can get away with whatever they like or can i think of some means to wage warfare below the threshold at which i think matters will get out of hand and become a conventional war so do i really want to expose myself to a situation where the indians decide oh these guys are bankrupt uh, they're good for nothing now i can do whatever i want i can go and assassinate who i want i can uh, uh, you know do what i like in kashmir and the pakistanis can't do anything back or do i want to show them that yeah i may have a lot of problems but don't think you can get away with anything uh, and i suspect uh, with my understanding of the pakistan army such as it is that they would probably be thinking we don't want to let the indians think they have a free right now and they can do whatever they like hence a lot of this poking um the problem as i said with poking is you never know when something will happen that gets out of hand and i imagine you know this bus went into a cart and it had a big fall after the driver was shot uh what if it hadn't been 10 people dead it had been 50 people dead um mm. what Because if right Because now of the- i think it's happening it went into the yes Yeah. what if prime minister modi swearing in hadn't been happening what if there was a moment of crisis for the indian government where the prime minister felt he couldn't afford to look weak mm. uh, what if uh, you know there was a situation where uh, as as has happened before mm. uh, with uri a famous instance led to the first indian cross border cross loc strikes Uh, i'm pretty sure the fidain who attacked that military camp did not dream in their wildest dreams that they would kill more than a dozen indian soldiers uh, there'd been many fidain attacks usually you know two fidain got killed maybe one or two soldiers got killed on this occasion they got 18 i think it was um, mm. and it was because some petrol drums had been left near the place these guys had been sleeping um, which caught fire now there's no way the attackers could have known that there are petrol drums carelessly stored lying around which will catch fire um but it caught fire and it led put the indian government in a position where it felt it had to react and attack across the loc um that could happen again and it really worries me and uh, certainly i i don't know if there's any uh, back channel or uh, secret channel going on now uh, but I, but i hope the intelligence services of the two countries are at least having a conversation about some of the risks over here uh because we've seen time and time again uh that we we end up in this same place again you know mm-hmm. um it happened with mumbai it happened with so many things uh mm-hmm. i hope some foolishness is not being planned i think mm-hmm. one of the dangerous things which has happened marvi is that mm-hmm. leaders in both countries have gone into these crises so often mm-hmm. that they convince themselves that they they're very wise and they can get out of it you know कि कुछ नहीं होगा संभाल लेंगे किसी yeah. तरह बट थिंग्स गेट हैंडल्ड यू नो अंटिल द डे दे डोंट गेट हैंडल्ड एंड टू न्यूक्लियर पावर्स रियली शुड नॉट बी फाइंडिंग सेल्स इन दिस होल टाइम एंड टाइम अगेन द स्टेक्स आर वेरी वेरी हाई हियर या बट आई अंडरस्टैंड योर यू नो व्हाई यू आर सो कन्विंस दैट इट वुड इट it you know there is more possibility that it was orchestrated from this side of the loc pakistani side of loc but i would go back to my original question which was because uh one uh whatever i said earlier about the uh the, the, the domestic aspect uh plus uh, i think two groups have claimed the responsibilities tigers uh, kashmir tigers or whatever yes. uh so do we know that this cannot be homegrown and it no i mean look uh, 
uh, earlier, uh, before 2001, basically, claims of responsibility used to be quite open. Mm -hmm. um, but then they declined. And after Pulwama, where, you know, these claims of responsibility and the video left behind caused a lot of embarrassment to Pakistan, mm -hmm. that 2008, the Mumbai attacks and all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these claims are given out in, by a welter of organizations, some of which are paper organizations. The name keeps changing. Uh, there was one claim by an organization called the Resistance Front, which is supposed to be a kind of front organization for lashkar e -Taiba. Then that was withdrawn by the Telegram group that had put it out, which is called the Jhelum Media Foundation. Now there is this kind of slightly opaque claim by uh, the Kashmir Tigers. Uh, mm. I wouldn't take all this very seriously because on ground there is no organization called Kashmir Tigers or anything else. Um, and what we do know about the attackers who've carried out these past attacks is they're extremely skilled, they're extremely mm -hmm. professional. Whoever is doing it is highly trained. And to the best of anyone's knowledge, there are only two organizations which have cadre who are that trained and disciplined, which are the lashkar e taiba and the Jaish. Even the major ethnic Kashmiri organizations like Hezbollah Mujahideen don't have that quality of uh, personnel. Um, so if I'm, you know, I'm, I'm betting here, it's a gamble. It would be one of these two guys. Uh, yeah. And we know in other cases that they have carried out similar attacks, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, on the army and, uh, just in fact, one of these four attacks to Fidain would just come across the border, uh, were, were killed. We've, you know, and we've seen, uh, social media from Pakistan reporting, uh, who they are, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, but so, it's very yeah. interesting that you say that uh, the K Kashmir Tiger, this organization on ground does not exist with this kind of finesse. But Indian media, most of Indian media has been calling Kashmir Tigers Pakistan back their group. So do they exist or do they not exist as you know? <laughs> I think there's a lot of loose reporting around this. In this social media age, uh, you know, people, including journalists, sadly, sometimes get carried away by things that are floating around on Telegram or on, you know, mm -hmm. Matrix or wherever. Uh, like I said, I'm an old guy. And like you very kindly said, I've been in this game for uh, more years than I care to advertise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so... I've learned not to take, you know, these things too seriously. I think right now, in fact, even my guess would be uh, Indian authorities are flailing around and the record is not a good one of finding hard evidence. So to go back to those massacres that happened in the mid and late 1990s, up to 1999, many, many, many massacres. We mm -hmm. don't know who the actual perpetrator was in any of those cases. In one massacre, the Chatti Singhpura case, uh, the Indians arrested a Pakistani national, they prosecuted him, the prosecution failed and he was sent back home to Pakistan. He was repatriated back across the line of control. Uh, in that Chatti Singhpura case, the journalist Barry Bierak visited the home of uh, one of the alleged killers and found a lot of evidence uh, that the uncle whom he visited was a, a Jamaat Dawa or lashkar e taiba person. He found a lot of photos and uh, mm -hmm. you know other things. Uh, but getting to the bottom of these things has always been very, very difficult. Uh, uh, journalistic, uh, you know, all criminals are free to go across the line of control whenever they feel like it. Criminals, terrorists, assassins, but journalists like you and me have always had uh, a rough time of going and digging into these things. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the information you get, unfortunately, has been secondhand or thirdhand. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, I'm reasonably persuaded that uh, it's it's you know whoever is doing it is likely doing it from uh, one of these two groups as i said i can only speculate as to what the motives hmm. of the isi may be but suddenly i see that a lot of characters who were you know told to sit inside their house and shut up uh, after pulwama are back uh, in the open and even molana masood azhar who pakistan said uh, had uh, you know uh, it disappeared and could not yeah. be found. Uh, recently, his organization back on, yeah. is back on social media back saying, I'll social say media in, in public life. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, but the, these attacks, once again, I'm sorry, this is uh, my second last question. Yeah, uh, please. Uh, as many so, as you want. Yeah. Um, so, these attacks seem to be 
uh, more anti hindu than anti than against the army because the encounters that happened after the riyasi attacks they were like encounters i mean uh, riyasi was i think was the original attack which happened against the hindus uh, and we know that before the state elections uh, i think it's before the state elections then another big event is amarnath yatra which is uh, going to happen, I think, a month from now or, uh, you know, very close. Do you see any more carnage uh, happening there? And uh, or do you do you think this was just the message that uh, they, they, they've just sent and now they will refrain from doing a big, uh, unfortunate thing uh, during the Amarnath Yatra? Well... <sighs> It's the Amarnath Yatra is always a possible target and it's an emotional issue in Kashmir. Unfortunately, uh, also many Hindu nationalists, uh, you know, ideologically motivated individuals have started making that pilgrimage. And sometimes there have been some, you know, unfortunate incidents with the local community uh, as a result. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a controversial thing. But Overall, I'd say that the Indian security forces have become quite good at protecting the Yatra by pumping in numbers of troops. Mm -hmm. And I think it's become clear on the Pakistani side also without anybody saying so that, look, this is one of those red lines you don't want to cross mm -hmm. uh, because it's so high profile, because it's so public. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I'm concerned. But my bigger concern is for killings that may happen in remote villages. Uh, hmm. where, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just impossible to have the numbers of police and military you need to protect them. Uh, to give you a sense, in 1998, when that killing in Prankot village had happened, uh, two days after the killing, uh, Chief Minister Farooq Abdullah and uh, Home Minister, then Home Minister uh, LK Advani, had taken a helicopter to the village. And when they landed, they discovered to their horror that they were the only people there. There was one lady who was a survivor but there were only bodies and, you know, bits of bodies strewn about hmm. uh, because the police party, which had started climbing from Riyasi more than a day earlier, uh, hmm. had still not managed to reach that village after a full day of, uh, hmm. you know, climbing up the mountainside. That's the kind of terrain we're talking about. There are these little villages scattered about the hills everywhere. Hmm. Uh, impossible to protect. Uh, one of my other fears is always that, uh, you know, there are embedded pockets of Muslim minorities in the Hindu majority areas of Jammu. Uh, there has been ugliness and friction there. Uh, that's another possibility of something erupting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so a communally volatile region in a way the Kashmir Valley is not. Mm -hmm. uh, and my, my real fear is that, you know, because of this, what happens in Jammu ends up having implications in the rest of India. Uh, hmm. I don't think, by the way, that uh, Prime Minister Modi would necessarily benefit from this, from the last NDA government. Uh, we know that it, it it really hurt them very, very hard because people say, hey, you talk about Hindus all the time, but you're not hmm. able to protect them. Um, so it weakened their position. And that's one reason why I think actually that uh, if there was to be, God forbid, any large scale communal killing, uh, the temptation for this NDA government to respond aggressively across the line of control would be that much higher because there would be people saying that, look, last time they didn't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Vajpayee didn't do it and Vajpayee paid the price. Uh, do you really want to pay the price? And uh, that could again spiral into, you know, a, a very unfortunate uh, and dangerous place. Yeah, I'm so I, 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 yeah. I, I, I worry about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think, you know, in the political leadership in Pakistan or in India, honestly, there is any appetite for war. And I think they both should have come away from Pulwama learning the lesson that, uh, look, things can very rapidly escalate to a point where, uh, to a point of no return. Mm -hmm. uh, there the pressure from our friends, mediation from various people help pull us both away from a place, you know, which would have been uh, very dangerous. Far worse, yeah. But, so, hmm. but who knows? Who knows? And we can only hope that things don't get uh, to that that point of, of no return. So my last question uh, is about, you know, you, you said, and quite rightly so, that Prime, Prime Minister Modi might not be able to benefit from it as much as is, is, is seen from the Pakistan side. Um, but uh, how would he 
what do you think would be the way he would respond? He from the mental, he always comes from the mentality of Guske Mara. So how, what will be, what might be the response from Indian side? Will there be any response? Or uh, Because uh, up till now, I did not see any uh, statement from Mr. Amit Shah, who is always very, he's, he's quite fond of making statements. Uh, there is no statement from uh, uh, Shri Jai Shankar. Uh, uh, so what do you, how, how do you okay. see it? So firstly, I think part of, Part of the reason for that silence is because they don't intend to do anything. Any election where this might be an issue, uh, you know, is a long way away in the future, mercifully. Uh, but such an incident happening as the Kashmir elections come closer, uh, where, you know, uh, the sort of glow of forming a government is not there, the reaction mm. may be different. Mm. Uh, I, let, let me present a counterintuitive perspective. I mean, I know Modi is seen as a very hawkish figure. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think he is a prime minister who instinctively believes in the use of military force. If you look at his military budgets, uh, they've been quite conservative. In fact, for his first uh, term in office uh, and for much of his second, he was criticized for not spending enough on the Indian military. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because he genuinely believes the age of conventional war is over. He doesn't want to get uh, mired in fighting wars, which he know will uh, have very bad consequences for the Indian economy. Note that even after this whole Chinese thing, mm. uh, he did not give a single speech where he said China had intruded anywhere into India. Uh, his uh, speech was, na koi udhar se aya hai, na koi idhar se gaya hai. Uh, whatever other people in his party said, ki Chinese ko tod denge, phod denge, he never said anything of this kind. Yeah. Uh, and he's he's a he's a cautious man. I think he understands that uh, some of the risks with conventional war and is actually more skeptical about the Indian Army's capabilities to decisively win a war uh, than any other recent prime minister. So there is unconventional war also. Exactly. And I think his chosen instruments, surgical I think his so strikes would be his chosen instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a man with patience. Uh, if he can eliminate the lashkar e taiba leadership or the Jaish leadership, he would certainly want to do it. His problem is he hasn't had a lot of success with this. I mean, so far, these Indian assassinations or alleged assassinations, I would, you know, because again, the proof is not very clear or transparent. Hmm. Uh, uh, the, these assassinations have mostly been of, uh, you know, uh, not of top figures, but of uh, the cook, the cleaner, the driver, the mali. Uh, these sec second rung kind of uh, characters um, and if there was to be a large killing he'd have to show something demonstrable um, now what that would be we don't know uh, in uh, Balakot after Pulwama uh, you know the Indian Air Force didn't get uh, the target it wanted the Pakistan uh, Air Force showed it could also deliver a slap or two uh, on, on the other side of the line of control so if it was it was left hanging in the air and things escalated. This time, I think he would be cautious and choose some other means. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it was to be a, a, a big incident, I think his options for holding back would be quite, quite limited. Um, and definitely he would have to think of some way uh, to pay back. Right now, I think the pressure is not on him because there's nothing, like I said, a big national election or pressure, you know, staring down the barrel. If this was government was to have survival issues, or if it was to be rapidly losing public support, then the context might be very different. Mm -hmm. uh, so context is kind of key right now. He has breathing space. In the future, he might not. Okay. So we'll, we'll have to leave it there. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Praveen. Uh, this was a very enriching uh, discussion, and I learned a lot. I hope our uh, our viewers would have learned a lot as well. As we conclude, uh, it's clear that the path to peace in Jammu and Kashmir is fraught with challenges, yet it is through dialogue, informed action, and unwavering commitment to justice that we hope to find a way forward. So stay engaged, stay informed, and join us next time as we continue to unravel the stories that matter uh, with the uh, Thank to Praveen Swami who brought us these insights. This is Marvi Sarma signing off from here from Unraveled. Good night 
and stay safe.